Yay. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Genevieve. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. I'm seeing the participant level increase. People are coming in. This is very exciting. And some will, of course, watch this in a later date on the video on our San Francisco Association of Realtors YouTube channel. And that's exciting as well. Marsha, what are we going to talk about today? Well, Dan, today we are going to talk about the new purchase agreement, oh my also God. known as the contract. Marcia, how is it that you and me know anything about this San Francisco purchase agreement? Do you have experience using such a contract? We sure do, Dan. Well, tell me. Uh, <laughs> both of us, and I believe you've been chair several years. I, I was chair a couple of years ago, the forums committee. And Dan was on the subcommittee that wrote this revision. So he's got some insider knowledge. Um, and I studied it extra hard so I could teach everybody and we could understand all the things you need to know and all the changes. Well, that is very nice of you. We thank you. And I believe that you're one of these active agent people who have buyers and sellers for a company called Vanguard Properties. Is that right? That is correct. And it turns out I may also be using this agreement. So I thought it would be a good idea to learn it. Great. And I work for a company called Compass where I do risk management and I help the agents understand what to use and when. So with that as our introduction and seeing that we have several dozens, in fact, a few score of agents on our call, shall we get started? Let's do it. Okay. So what we're going to do today is take you through the contract paragraph by paragraph, speak to how to use the contract. If you've never used either the old or the, or this version of the contract, you'll learn how to use it today. If you're familiar with the old contract and looking to become knowledgeable about any changes or this new version, you will also learn that. So as we go through, you're going to see some text highlighted in yellow. And for those of you interested in understanding the updates or changes, those are items that are new or different. Um, all of the content is still relevant, just so we, you can kind of utilize this training to your needs specifically. So the yellow is a little reminder that this is probably a bit different from the last version. Great. That's right. Speaking Very of good. different, there are now three different ways that our agents are accessing the purchase agreement and the other forms. Zip form continues to be very popular, overwhelmingly so, but the agents now also have access through SkySlope forms and through Glide forms. All of our, um, all of our forms, our entire SFCA library, as it says, by the way, it doesn't say SFAR because of the stupid Santa Fe Association of Realtors, um, anyhow, we're SFCA library, uh, is available to all of us, right? Anybody at no additional cost. So if you have trouble finding it in your library, get a hold of either SkySlope, Glide, or Zip Forms, and they will help you. Okay. And I will do one other shout out on that. I just discovered this yesterday, and I know it was announced recently that SFAR now has a licensing agreement with SFAA, San Francisco Apartment Association, for some of their forms. And people have asked for those lease forms for a long time. Um, and you can access them through, I believe, today it's Glide and Skyslope. I got them on Skyslope yesterday. Um, and then ultimately, it'll be on those three platforms, so including ZipForm in the future. I think, in fact, they're there. And you'll, look, you'll be looking for an SFAA library that will only be available to those who are members of the San Francisco Association of Realtors as a member benefit, okay? All right, let's rock and roll. Okay. Here it is. Yay. So you will notice some things moved around and we're gonna go through. So you have this in front of you, you're sitting down, hopefully before you are talking to your buyer or seller. Um, about a specific offer and taking them through this. So this class will also help you understand um, how to explain this contract to your clients in advance of them either making or receiving an offer. And one of the reasons for some of these changes and these structural changes was to bring all of the deal points or as many as practical up to the first two pages and make it much more readable by your client. And I think your clients will find the whole thing much more readable. 
All right, I'm going to start us out. So this is the date prepared goes in the top left. Um, any date can go in here. It's a reference date um, against other documents. So you might have some addenda or other documents that you're referencing this date to make sure they attach to the correct contract. Otherwise, it's not a particularly interesting date. You don't need to update it over and over. Just make sure it's consistent across your documents. And none of your deadlines are based on that date. Totally arbitrary. Okay. All right. Who's the buyer? You're going to discuss this with your client, even though it may seem obvious. Um, are they an individual or an entity? It might be a trust or an LLC. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but important to know up front. And also, it's a good idea for them to have that conversation among themselves and make plans if they need to, um, depending on how they plan to hold the property. And later on, we'll see that there is a built-in assignment, and it's very easy now to assign to your own trust or LLC, but it takes time to set one up. So if Marsha and I bought together, maybe we wanted the Abrahams Hershkowitz LLC, we got to get it in place so that it is, in fact, in good standing with the state of California before we do that assignment. That's right. All right. Purchase price. Well, that's important. You're going to fill in the purchase price there. It appears as numerical values. Um, it used to be spelled out. It's no longer spelled out. It's going to be a number. And this is where the property address goes. So you'll find this on the prelim or tax summary. Always a good idea to cross check, um, double check the seller's name on those documents as well. In San Francisco, we tend to have uh, a fair amount of information going into an offer. So you, you probably are going to have a disclosure package that has a bunch of other things in it. Just double check everything. Make sure you understand who the seller is. Um, and then this is a, whoops, a yellow item. Is a property of a fractional interest, TIC or co-op? If so, check the box. So you'll see below, it's right below that section. It's not highlighted specifically, but there are two check boxes. Um, and if it's a TIC, you're going to be checking that top box. If it's a stock cooperative, you will be checking the lower box. When you check this box in any of those platforms, it will automatically pull that addendum into your transaction. Um, so what you'll notice is it'll give you a little notice that says this has been added and then you'll be filling out that addendum separately in your transaction and making sure that you reference it in your additional terms and submitting it with your offer. You'll also note that we moved the expiration up to the top here. The expiration was buried on page two or three before. I don't really know why, but, and so now we know right away, hey, this is an offer for how, you know, this property at this amount from this buyer, and here's when it expires. And the default now is three or blank days after being fully signed by the buyer or on a specific date and time, which is my preference because we know exactly when that date and time is. Uh, being fully signed by the buyer means the last signature date and time and uh, often up to subject to interpretation. So let's avoid the interpretation. A specific date and time is easiest. And this is just a reminder for people who were using the old contract. Sometimes listing agents, it, it used to be based on when the offer was presented, which gave listing agents a, a lot of <laughs> maneuverability there. Yeah, it did not, didn't make a lot of sense. So now um, if you're a listing agent, make sure you're communicating that offer in a timely fashion to your client and um, presenting it so they can have all their options. All right, agency. Well, this is an important one. You're gonna fill out the seller's brokerage firm, the seller's agent, buyer's brokerage firm, and the buyer's agent. And don't forget the dual agency is any agents working under the same brokerage. So if you've got two Compass agents, it's gonna be dual agency. And the system should not allow you to check anything other than dual agency in that case when you're filling out the form using any of these online systems. Once you check the first one that says both buyer and seller, the system will automatically check the next three 
And for those of you who think that, that was wrong, it isn't. That's the way it's supposed to be. So a vanguard is on both sides. It doesn't matter that you're on one side and another agent is on the other. It's Vanguard that's on both sides, or Keller Williams that's on both sides, or Coldwell Banker that's on both sides, and you'll be checking the box both buyer and seller. The moment you do that, it will auto-populate all of those, okay? All right. Okay, complete the escrow holder. So this section is pretty similar to before. Um, you may want to specify an escrow officer's name if there's someone specific your buyer wants to work with. Um, you're going to complete the number of days for the escrow period. And just a reminder, um, as opposed to stating a closing date, it's valuable to consider putting in a number of days should there be extended negotiation. There are a few scenarios where you specifically want to close on a, on a very specific date for other reasons. I would say that's less common. So think about your negotiating period and Typically, we're writing in, you know, 21 to 30 days for most deals. And for those of you who remember, escrow holder and close of escrow used to be buried on pages two or three or something. And so now here they are on the first page where they belong. Very obvious. Okay. All right. Aha, finance terms. So here's the big controversy. There's one thing that's missing, non-contingent financing. And it's missing from this contract. If you remembered, it was in the old contract. But if you're used to using, for instance, the car purchase agreement or the PRDS purchase agreement, nothing's missing. This is the way that theirs look as well. But you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, it is non-contingent financing. What do I do? Well, is your client getting for financing? Are they having a first loan? If they're having a first loan, you'll be entering that into paragraph 4C. If they're not getting a first loan, and it's all cash, then you don't enter anything in there. If they're getting a first loan and a second loan, then you'll be using 4C for the first loan and 4D for the second loan. Now, the only question I have is, does your client need a contingency for that financing? And if they do, great. We'll see in paragraph eight in a moment that it defaults to a contingency and it defaults to a certain number of days and you could change that. But if your client is getting non-contingent financing, then what are you doing? You're removing the contingency. There is not a checkbox right here to remove that contingency, and therefore you will be using the contingency removal form. A policy decision has been made for risk management purposes and for communication between you and your client to use the contingency removal form to remove all contingencies. It makes it very easy for your client to understand, oh, I had a contingency, but I've just removed it or waived it, okay? Whereas before we used to hear all the time from a buyer who said, I didn't realize it was non-contingent financing. They simply docu-signed me this contract. It said something about financing. I just presumed it was contingent, okay? All right, I'm gonna go back. Okay, initial deposit, typically 3% in our market. Um, the default is two business days. So you can change your deposit deadline depending on what your client is able to do and, and wants to include in their offer. Um, deposit timeline is business days. That hasn't changed. And then an additional deposit is not as common in our market. But if you do one, make sure you're using the car increased deposit and liquidated damages addendum. Otherwise, liquidated damages does not apply. And we're going to talk more about liquidated damages later in a couple of, of points. But um, less common for that increased deposit, but certainly something to keep in mind if you're doing that. All right, so Dan, you covered most of this already, but I'll just hit the high points. So you're going to fill in that loan contingency, new first loan, if the buyer is taking a loan. Um, and you want to make sure you fill out some of these other terms in there if they like this contingency. So you're going to want to have a maximum percentage filled out to not uh, not to exceed X percent for the loan. Um, and then if appropriate, you're going to check that other box for the fixed rate period, et cetera. Uh, really, really important to fill these things out. If you don't specify the some terms around the loan, that contingency isn't necessarily going to do your client a lot of good. Um, if someone argues, well, they can still get a loan, but they could get a loan for 20% interest or something 
which is not a loan they'd be willing to take. Ambiguity is not your friend, particularly when you're the one who initiated the contract, it would be construed against you. And so the, as Marsha points out, someone, meaning the seller will say, hey, you didn't fill in an amount uh, percentage rate for the loan. So we're gonna presume it's at any rate and they must be able to get a loan at some rate. I used to use as an example, 7% is a very high rate. <laughs> we're gonna have to change that now. Yeah, you notice I use 20%. <laughs> Let's try to keep this, keep this valid for a while. Um, okay, other important considerations. Of course, the financial qualifications of the buyers, typically we, what we think about, um, but also the property qualifying. You know, are there specific things about the property? A class San Francisco example would be, um, does it have a brick foundation? Well, there are certain lenders who won't lend on a brick foundation. So, you know, these are things that are important to understand and also consider in um, whether or not you're going to have a finance contingency. Also, qualification of HOA, um, that HOA financial disclosure would potentially come up in that conversation. So important to think about both the buyer profile and their qualifications and also the property you're making an offer on. And Great. finally, cash balance. So this hasn't changed, but when you start filling in these numbers, it's going to automatically populate some numbers in other fields. So depending on how you're filling this out, you're going to have an initial deposit. You may have a loan amount. You may then have the, um, you, you know, you're going to have a cash balance depending on your loan amount, or if it's all cash, that's just going to be the difference between the initial deposit and the purchase price. So yeah, just it's going to, to do some home. calculating for you. Just to bring that Problem, that issue home. So if you are making an all cash offer, it's $5 million, you're going to put down 3%, let's say that's $150,000. That's your initial deposit. It will immediately auto calculate cash balance to be 5 million minus 150. So 4.85. And then it will show the purchase price at $5 million. If it's all cash, there's nothing else to do. If your client is getting a loan, now it's time to enter the loan amount in uh, the appropriate paragraph. Okay. Okay. And just to underscore this, because I know this question has come up, if your client is taking traditional financing, even if it's non-contingent, do not write it in other financing. You're going to write it in the new first loan, and then you're going to waive that contingency. Right, because what your client is doing is your client is taking financing, and it's, it's traditional, <laughs> conventional financing with a traditional bank. The only thing your client is doing is waiving the contingency at the time you're submitting the offer, which is hardly new for any of us. Okay. That's right. Okay. We hit most of this, but I'm going to make one more point about this. Um, the finance contingency now explicitly says you cannot exercise it for a low appraisal. So historically, the contract was a little bit um, less specific about this point and people... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Dan's making faces of it. Uh, it said nothing. Our contract it said nothing. <laughs> 100 percent silent on this issue. The car contract is 100 percent one way. The PRDS contract is 100 percent the other way. We now match car, and here's what we do. It if says, "Oh, you go ahead, Dan." I'm sorry. If your client wants an appraisal contingency, you need an appraisal contingency. If your client does not have an appraisal contingency, meaning your client has filled out the contingency removal form and checked the box, no appraisal contingency. If your client is otherwise approved for the loan, then your client cannot back out because the lender says it didn't appraise for, as much, as, for value because the lender is perfectly happy to lend you the property. They're just gonna require your client put down more money. So if your client does not have more money to put down, and needs the property to appraise for the appraisal value, please don't remove the appraisal contingency. It's that simple. Oh, I think we've covered that. Yep. Okay. And this is a change. Um, this contract now defaults to having an appraisal contingency before it was the other way around. It's a little more intuitive, I think. Um, this contract then, actually defaults to having all of the contingencies mm -hmm. and they need to be actively removed using the contingency removal form. And that decision may be frustrating to some, but it's very obvious to your client. And before there was a lot of hide the ball. That's right. Um, and then similar to before, if you'd like to write in a different number, 
for which the property must appraise, perhaps a slightly lower number. If your clients are comfortable with that, you're going to write it in in that line. Okay, number six. Dan, you want to take that? Yeah, so it defaults to the buyer intends to use the property as a primary residence. If they don't, you have a couple of choices. And these choices may read differently than what you're used to, but this is what the standard is requested by the lender industry. They want either primary residence, secondary residence, or investment property. And you'll see that it, that's very similar to the wording that's in the car contract as well. All right, physical possession. So this is going to default to the time of recordation. So when the city acknowledges the sale. Um, we'll note here, if there is what we call colloquially a rent back, um, you're going to have a seller license to remain in possession addendum. And there you're going to check that box there. And it's going, that addendum is going to outline everything that relates to when, how long the seller is staying past close of escrow, all the terms around that, um, and when the buyer is gonna be moving into the property. Contingencies, all right, I'm gonna start us out. <laughs> this is this has brought up a lot of discussion. This is the new grid, um, as Dan mentioned, similar to CAR. And all of the contingencies in the contract are here in this grid, which is nice because then it's very clear to discuss with your client. These are the contingencies that could exist um, in the default contract. Let's talk about whether or not the buyer has chosen to waive them. Um, and this is going to define all the timelines around that. As Dan mentioned earlier, all contingencies need to be actively removed meaning they have to be removed in writing using it, typically using a contingency removal form. Um, and we're gonna get to that in a second. Do not write in zero days for any of these if your intention is to remove the contingency. You're gonna need to you use- You won't be able to, the program won't let you. And it's just not clear. Um, if you're I think some people were doing workarounds, that's why I mention it. Just. Don't do it because that doesn't actually remove the contingency either. <laughs> and, and honestly, um, the other side won't really know what you mean. When we faced this issue a few years ago at CAR, we put out a little poll and survey asking people what they think zero meant. And you can't believe how many different answers we got. Whereas if you attach the contingency removal form, as it says here, and you check the box that says my client removes this contingency, it's clear to everyone. So let's talk a little bit about the grid while we have it in front of us and see what it defines. So on the far left, you're going to see that paragraph column. Um, and these are all the reference paragraphs. So similar to the newer car contract, what they've done here is they've get referenced all of the paragraphs where this topic appears and where you might find more information about these contingencies in the body of the contract. Um, so you can see loans you'll find on pa paragraph four and 14, um, appraisal, paragraph five, lease or lien items, 10D. So you can follow that. And if your clients have any questions or you want to understand better, and you should, of course, read the, the entire contract, but um, you're going to reference those specific paragraphs. Next column is the actual contingency. Next column, duration after seller acceptance. So this is how long the contingency lasts um, or what you've agreed to for that period. Appraisal, I believe, used to be 17 days. Is that right, Dan? And now it's 21 mm -hmm. default. I don't even remember, sorry. Uh, that was changed. So a few of these timelines have changed on their default. Typically, we end up writing in um, numbers there anyway, so be mindful of that. And then that last column is, um, the seller's duty of when they're going to be delivering these documents to the buyer. So, um, and very handy for your client to understand exactly what all the deadlines are. For those of you who say eh, those deadlines aren't realistic, um, frankly, a decision was made to make them all the same or where possible make them the same to make it easier for you to keep track of. Um, plus, market conditions are always changing. So, 15 days may make sense today and 21 may make sense today for an appraisal or a loan, but it's hard to know what's going to make sense next year. Um, but they're so easily changed. So talk with your client, work with your client, work with the other side um, and make the appropriate changes. That's right. And 
just a reminder to everybody, a contingency goes on and on and on until someone issues a notice to perform. So contingency starts. And then at that, as you get close to the deadline, you will have the right to issue a notice to perform to the other party. We'll get to that a little bit later. Should you want to do that, depending on what's happening with the transaction. Okay. All right. Waiver or removal of contingency. So there's been a lot of conversation about this. Um, and I'm sure in the Q&A, we'll have some questions come up and we can speak to this point. But this has always been true. If you have not received adequate information on one of these points, um, your client should not be advised to waive a contingency without the information that they believe they should have received or that would satisfy that, um, that line item for them. So that might be HOA information, um, the you know, HOA financial disclosure, might be meeting minutes, might be things like that. Um, could, could be, be San Francisco seller disclosure, it could be leases, right. it could be tenant estoppels, the protected tenant status form, it could be the seller's own documents. So the warning here is, hey, if you don't have the documents, don't remove the contingency, because if you do remove the contingency, you've created a waiver. That is no different from what it was in the last contract, and that's no different from what it states in the car contract. It's just that it's made very obvious to you here. There is a quote unquote exception here that says, listen, you can't waive statutory rights. And so the paragraph numbers for the TDS, the lead based paint, the natural hazard disclosure, et cetera, are referenced there and says, even if you wanted to waive these, your removal is ineffective the, to the extent that there is a TDS required seller has to give it, for instance. And it also says that we're not going to waive the San Francisco seller disclosure. We just sort of made a contractual uh, decision that, hey, that San Francisco seller disclosure is really important. Uh, it has lots of important information, and we're going to make it hard for the parties to try to waive that. They'd have to write in some additional terms if they want to try to waive that. All right. Um, and the other point I'll make here is when you're reviewing disclosures with your buyers, and um, even maybe before you're discussing with them on your own review, you're going to be looking for signs of whether or not some of these things apply. You're going to be looking to see if there are indications that there are least or lead items. That's a question on SFSD, on the San Francisco seller disclosure. So you're going to be looking for these things. Hey, do we think these things exist? Has the seller told us they exist? If they do, you, the next question would be, do we have copies of these lease agreements? What, is, what do they say? So, you know, as you're reading the disclosures in full, you should be getting some information about this, assuming it's a pretty um, robust disclosure package or complete disclosure package. And so as agents, part of our job is also to look for signs there and point that out to our clients and say, hey, looks like this. Um, just as a heads up, if they've said, yes, we have all these least things and then you have no more information, that should trigger in your head, hey, we need to ask for this information and maybe retain that not maybe, but if you don't have it and you're writing an offer, retain that contingency to get that information, work through it. All right, this is what the contingency removal form looks like. Um, you will notice it does not have an all option. That's also been a point of discussion. <laughs> People love the all historically. You know who really loves the all? The agent. The seller. <laughs> <laughs> the agent who doesn't really understand what the contingencies are and does not want to have an actual meaningful conversation with their buyer to make sure that their buyer understands each of the contingencies before they remove them. So it's very easy to check an all box and never have a conversation with your client. Well, what does it mean, title review? Oh, that preliminary title report and all the exceptions. We sent that thing to you. I don't remember that. Did you review the exceptions? I don't remember that. So this forces a conversation with your client. Uh, you may not like it, but it's certainly the best way to go. Um, there's one other thing I was going to mention here, and I it was important, so I don't want to lose it. Um, oh, I, I, this is just a tip that when you're reviewing disclosures, helpful to have this contingency removal just sitting on your desk and to look at it and say, do we have these things? Or have they given us these documents? 
um, because it goes through and, and sort of is an overview of things you really should have. Um, so it's a nice cross check just to make sure there's nothing missing from the disclosure package. Um, and then of course, understanding what that information says and you know your clients making a decision about whether or not they're comfortable with the information they've received. So helpful. You know, Marcia, I, I gotta say you and I have a disagreement here on the last bullet point. I would never have added this. If a contingency does not apply to the property, like, oh, that's right, Dan. We we do disagree about this. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I would say if, if the property is not an HOA, if you read the HOA paragraph, which is paragraph 17, it starts with if the property is located in an HOA or a common interest development, then the buyer's purchase is contingent upon that. My position is that if it's not in one, why would we be removing that contingency? Um, I would be really concerned that what if we found out later, oh yeah, there is an HOA, because sometimes there is, it only deals with the gardening up front, but there is one, I wouldn't want to remove a contingency if I didn't have the information. So we're going to have to just agree to a disagree on that. And I, I think we're also going to see um, probably at, at minimum a change to the contract at some point in the future, just clarifying in that grid, if applicable. You're going to see the words if applicable show up in that grid in the future, probably just for full clarity to Dan's point. If it doesn't apply, then you don't need to remove it. Okay. Okay. So we can. Great. All right. This is a fun one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what comes with the property, right? Items included or excluded in the sale. This is certainly, hopefully, going to be looking familiar to us because it's certainly similar to what it used to be. We've added a few things to try to make things clear, given that we now have electric vehicle chargers. So there's now a, a pre checked box. There's a discussion about, for instance, things like Nest and uh, Ring doorbells, trying to make it more obvious what is and isn't included. Um, and I would say this, that for those of you who are all about checking all of the boxes, um, it's only if the property actually has them. So when you check a box that says wine fridge, if the property never had a wine fridge, fortunately, the way this contract is written is the seller is not now obligated to buy you a wine fridge. Um, it says specifically to the extent that these things actually are existing at the property at the time the, prop the parties get into contract. All right, and there is, you see that under 10, Right at the very bottom above B, there's a checkbox that says, if checked, paragraphs one and two of the SFR, SFAR form, FPPP, seller preferences, dated X, replace, replaces paragraph B and C. So what that is, um, is the fixtures and personal property preferences form. And this would be something that a seller who has very specific preferences over what personal property is gonna be included or excluded, um, would provide in their disclosure package. So that's heads up to listing agents. If you have a seller who's very specific about these things, take a look at that form and make a decision with them if you'd like to provide it. Um, this is really just an easy tool to define those things. And then should the buyer want to comply with that, they can just check this box in the contract and attach that addendum to this offer to make sure there's no confusion about transcribing all of the specific items that the seller really had noted they wanted in their disclosure package. Um, okay, buyer agents. You're gonna take note of personal property, you're gonna look at all of the documents, but at the end of the day, this contract prevails. So make sure things are written in um, as being included or excluded if that's appropriate for clarity because this is what's gonna I always like to check one the blank box and write in all existing appliances just in case I miss something. But as you and I have been discussing, this is a good time to go back and actually look at the photos and look at the marketing materials. The marketing materials do not make the contract, as you point out, but they do remind us, oh, yeah, they said that the children's play structure is to be included. Well, I can't rely on the marketing materials, but if I want that children's play structure, let's write it in. And if somebody says, well, isn't children's play structure a fixture? Let's not be wrong about it, right? Let's not have a fight about it. Let's write it in, okay? 
Right. And, and by the way, also things you don't want. You may just as equally not want the children's play structure. You really want them to remove it. You cannot stand those cherubs that are the, um, <laughs> the, the fountains, right? And you want those removed. All right. It's an obligation for the seller to disclose leased or leaned items um, and an obligation for the buyer to take on those contracts along with any transfer costs and, and um, costs to consider uh, to continue with the lease. So this is super important. And even if you don't necessarily think it's going to be applicable, you're looking for signs that it's applicable. And you're looking for in the San Francisco seller disclosure, there's a question about this. Um, so the seller should be, if you have that document, when you write the, the offer, the seller, if there is something lease or lane, they'll say yes, they'll provide a little more information. As I mentioned earlier, good time to ask for follow-up documentation if you don't have it, um, either before you're writing the offer or you're retaining this contingency for that. Um, and, this, and you can always, oh, go ahead, Dan. I was going to say this contingency works both for buyer and seller, right? And so the idea here is that the buyer must take on, unless they agree otherwise, all of the leases, all of the liens, all the maintenance agreements, and the seller will be coming out of pocket zero dollars for all of that. So we really need to understand what transfer costs there are, right? And what those maintenance agreements are in the future. And so that's why there is this contingency and a fairly significant period of time for the buyer to review these leased or liened items. Um, there is a car form called solar, and that would be useful if you wish to have the seller fill it out in advance. It's like a little SPQ for those of you who are familiar with the SPQ. It just pertains to what solar items are there. It's sort of the first page is a disclosure, an advisory, pardon me, uh, talking about what solar is all about. And the second page is for the seller to fill out. We don't require it, but it may be very helpful. And it also may be very helpful when the seller owns the solar systems, right? So if the seller owns the solar systems, there is no contingency for the buyer to review, which can really be an issue because what if we do have maintenance agreements? Really very frustrating. We should be providing all of those maintenance agreements. The solar system, I'm sorry, the solar form itself can be helpful in that regard. All right. Um, one last note on that. When you're reviewing the pre-lib, um, you may see, see leaned items as well. So another place to look for it. There are many, it may appear nowhere obvious to you, but if you see something on there, it's worth a, a follow-up question. And that would likely be a PACE or a HERO loan may, sh may show up on the prelim. All right, contract addenda. So this is a handy little paragraph that lets you check common addenda that you might want to include if applicable. Um, you've got a 1031 exchange on either side. So you could check that buyer seller. Um, if it's a backup offer addendum, if it's um, contingent on the sale of the buyer's property or any other addendum, you can just put a number in there and check this box. Great. All right. And it, it will attach that addendum or it, it will load it to your transaction in whatever platform you're using. So it'll populate it and then you just need to go out and fill that out separately and attach it to your offer. All right, so this is that paragraph 14 that that grid at the beginning referenced and it goes through the specific terms of the finance contingency. Um, keep in mind, all of the timelines only appear on the grid on page two. None of these contingency timelines appear in these paragraphs. This is further explanation and terms around that contingency. So as you're reviewing it, you're going to want to take your clients through these paragraphs as well, not just the grid on page one. So they really understand what the provision says and what the contingency is. Um, and then the timelines around that are on page two grid. And, and then, best practice, of course, is to send your client the contract ahead of time and let them do some reading. That's right. And this is a, a new addition. Um, buyers to provide proof of funds within three days. Um, so just FYI, if you're not showing proof of funds with your offer, just make sure your clients understand that that's um, now in the contract that they'll be providing that to the other side. And if you're the seller and you don't have proof of funds, right, you want to, on behalf of your client, make sure that you have them. 
And if they don't provide them to you, you can send them a notice to perform, right? Because it's a contractual obligation. And then in theory, if they don't provide you with the proof of funds, your client could cancel, which you actually may want to. Right? The idea may be, hey, is this person real? Right? They aren't even providing us with proof of funds. Um, and so now we are concerned that they're not real. And now you have a, a way out for your client. For the seller, correct. Yeah. All right. Title review. So this goes through what that can, it establishes the contingency for buyer review of the preliminary title report. Um, make sure you read and, and your client reads all of the hyperlinked information. Uh, super important. There are extensive documents linked in all of these prelims for the most part. And, you know, it's really the meat of the exception typically is in that link, not necessarily in the little description. So very important to do that. Um, when I'm doing my disclosure packages, I find it's helpful just to also to PDF that those, um, you know, what's at the other end of those links also, just so someone has those documents available and it's very clear to them um, that they are in fact part of the prelim. And then finally, this, again, the length of the contingency period only appears on, on the grid. And by the way, one of the questions that was asked was, what about when we have a signed disclosure packet and they sign off on the disclosure packet and it says they're going to provide the AVID within 48 hours? Is this the same thing as removing a contingency? And the answer is no. The receipt for disclosures is completely a separate act from a removal of a contingency. And the contract makes it clear that there's only one way to remove a contingency. It's to remove the contingency. Okay. In a little while, we'll see that there's some distinction with regards to a transfer disclosure statement, which is completed and provided before, before the buyer makes the offer. Uh, that tracks a statutory rule. Um, but otherwise, when you have your client has acknowledged receipt of documents, yes, we have the HOA documents. Yes, we have the pest inspection report, the home inspection report. Yes, we have the leases, et cetera. Your client hasn't given up their right to review them and their contingency to cancel the contract if they're dissatisfied with the review of them until they submit a contingency removal form. Now they could get all of those documents ahead of time and with the, can, with the offer, submit a contingency removal form, removing all of them and therefore be providing you with a non-contingent offer. But just because they've received your disclosure packet or even initial the receipt of your disclosure packet, that should not be confused with the same thing as removing their contingency and therefore cancellation rights, okay? Great. All right, the investigation contingency. This oh, is a, this a, this big is a one. good one. I know, and I think it's making a comeback. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, okay, the question, why do they call it an investigation contingency and not an inspection contingency? Well, Dan, that's because it includes a lot more than just showing up at the property and looking at the physical aspects. So uh, the invest yes, the investigation contingency covers a whole slew of things like, is there insurance available? Different square footage numbers that might exist about the property. What's your intended use? Do you want to develop it? And you're, you know, does, what is DBI going to allow to be built there? Planning is going to be, a, a, what would they allow to be developed? So um, pretty much any question that relates to the condition of the property, usability, anything you could think of could fall under this investigation contingency. If your clients, neighborhood. That's right. Yeah. Yep. If your clients have questions about any of those things, keeping this investigation contingency in place um, is advisable. And this is a lot of yellow here, so I'll point this out, super important. In addition and separate from the investigation contingency that we all know and love, this contract now allows for informational access. It's not a contingency. It just has a provision that says um, buyers may access the property for X number of days um, for informational purpose purposes, um, or they waive the, waive the access. So I want to point out, this is the one of the very few terms that appear in the body of the contract that has a number of days. Um, 
at the very beginning, we see, of course, dates and price, you know, purchase price and all those things. And then this is really the only other spot that we see a number of days appear. And it's in paragraph 16. So you want to make sure to check this out, eat whether you're the buyer's rep or the seller rep. Um, because let's just read this term. It says B, informational access. Buyers shall have reasonable access to the property for informational purposes only for 21 or blank days after acceptance, separate from this investigation contingency or buyer waives access. So by checking that box, the buyer can say, no, we're not going to take advantage of that. We're not going to do that. Um, or you can write in a shorter period of time. I know that um, some agents out there have said, hey, um, it would be our pre listing agents have said it would be the seller's preference. If you're including an investigation contingency, please match the number of days. So you're asked, you know, we've agreed you can come into the property and do your investigation. Let's just keep it to that same period of time for all of this. And some buyers say, well, no, we really need more time after. It's not a contingency. We're done with our investigation. But now we have a better understanding of what the condition of the property is. We want to bring our contractor through who's going to do the work um, for another walkthrough now that we've actually removed our contingency to talk about the details and to try to get the ball rolling so we don't waste as much time after close of escrow. Or it's as simple as we want to bring our interior designer in or um, my wife and I want to come back so we can do some measurements and figure out where the dining table is going to go and whether or not our L-shaped couch is going to fit. All of that is informational access, right? In theory, you could bring a contractor with you or some professional who's going to help you with whatever the process is afterwards. And does that frighten the seller? Sure. And should it? Sometimes, yes. I appreciate that. Um, does this match what CAR does and what the PRDS contracts do? Yes. So most of the state has this same exact concept. Okay. And, and I just want to say a little warning here. Do not use this as some sort of default contingency or something thinking that if you go into the property and you discover something that it's going to be um, create some new contingency. Don't use it that way. That's not what this is. Um, it's just going to create a fight. Yeah, really, that's not what this is. Okay. All right. HOA disclosures, paragraph 17. So if the property, as it says there, is located a common interest development, which includes condominiums, co-ops, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a CID, it's a HOA. What do they have to do? And this is reminding us what you have to do. You have to provide the, the seller, I'm sorry, the buyer within the time specified in paragraph eight. Because remember, all the time frames are in paragraph eight with these documents, the CCNRs, the uh, bylaws, the articles of incorporation, if they exist, the most recent one-year meeting minutes, a reserve study, if it exists, you have to fill out or have the HOA fill out the condominium cooperative financial disclosure statement, et cetera. It's all here. The time frames, both when the seller is going to provide these documents and how long the buyer has to review them, is in the grid. And by the way, the grid defaults to any documents that are provided late, a minimum of five days to review. So if the seller was supposed to provide them within 10 days and the buyer had 17 days uh, as their contingency, the delta there is seven days. What if they didn't get you the documents until day 15? Does the contingency still exist at 17 days? The contract reads in paragraphs eight, and nine that you have a minimum of five days in that case. Okay? And there's some other specifics here. So what if we have new information, right? So if there's new HOA information and we're very specific here, what if we learn in the middle of this transaction that the dues are going up, right? Oh boy, that's a big deal, right? And so how big of a deal is it? Is it a material fact that the seller should be able to cancel? Well, the forms committee made a decision a few years ago to say, hey, so long as there's an increase that's not more than 10%, then we've all agreed the buyer's going to continue. But if there is an increase of 10% or more, or you can fill in an actual amount if that's what you'd like to do, or a new special assessment, right? Then now we have the buyer having a new or renewed contingency to review these documents 
and cancel if dissatisfied. And that new contingency is five days. All right. All about tenants. So this is the rental property section. Um, may or may not be applicable to the property, but you want to make sure you, you know if it's applicable um, prior to waiving, of course. And this is going to this lists everything that they have to provide for rental property. So leases and estoppels, um, any sort of accounting documents, financials for that rental property, um, any rental personal property uh, that's a part of this uh, property so, is being transferred. For instance, there was a lawnmower and some furniture in the lobby, right? And some equipment on the roof that's used to clean the windows, whatever that, that equipment or a refrigerator right? Maybe each rental unit comes with a refrigerator that's owned by the seller. That would be rental property, personal property. And paragraph seven says, okay, we need to provide a list uh, for the buyer within so many period of time. And finally, residential rent and eviction control, super important. If your client is you know, purchasing a property that's tenant occupied, if they're thinking about placing a tenant, as a certain note, they should familiarize themselves with these laws. We know San Francisco is incredibly strict. California also has some new restrictions in place um, from a couple of years ago. So be mindful of eviction control and rent control when they apply. Okay. And by the way, I love to say this. If your client does not wish to have tenants, stop showing them property with tenants in it. Okay. <laughs> because trying to draft around that is incredibly dangerous in San Francisco. Every property is eviction controlled. So putting in a term in the contract that says the buyer, I'm sorry, the seller will provide the property vacant at close of escrow is a bad idea. Setting up a breach of contract for the seller who can't get it done or can't get it done lawfully or setting up disappointment for the buyer, right? Who's only gonna learn, you know, 30 days into this thing that that can't be done. And now what do they do? Okay. Good point. Um, 19, closing cost allocations. So content hasn't changed here, but it has been reorganized a bit. Um, you see shell or sell pay the following, transfer tax, cost of loans paid through escrow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then buyer shall pay. and prorations um, between the two parties. So again, if you're familiar with the old contract, who pays what hasn't changed. This just is reorganized to clearly list which party is paying which items. And this is a new uh, requirement. It is now an explicit buyer requirement that the buyer shall return to seller signed copies of the disclosure documents at least five days prior to closing. So we, and, and five I think was, it's been in practice. People, of course, try to make this happen. Now it's in the contract. In five days was just pulled out of the air, right? Trying to give them enough time to be able to do it, but enough time to actually make sure you have them and your TCs are happy and your auditor is happy that you have it in your file. All right. Here we are, disclosure documents. So we've got two categories that used to be grouped together. Now they're separate. I think it's really nice to have them separate um, to help people understand which categories of disclosures um, fall under, you know, certain disclosure requirements, as Dan said earlier, are legally required for the seller to make. Other ones are required by this contract. So those are two different categories. The statutory disclosures are required by law. And so they fall under this, um, a number of different rules. And this contract does its best to simplify that to a degree and say, the seller is legally required to provide the following items. Uh, that includes the TDS, the natural hazards disclosure, the earthquake risk disclosure, if it's applicable um, to the era of construction, lead-based paint hazards disclosure, again, if applicable to the era, um, and the building permit history or 3R report. Those are all statutory requirements. And therefore you can't waive the right to them. So even if you sign a contingency removal form that removes them, 
if they were required by law and they were never provided by the seller, then the waiver is ineffective as a matter of law and the contract reminds us of that. But that doesn't mean you can't review them up front in the disclosure packet. Nothing has changed here, right? So if you have these completed in a disclosure packet up front and your client has reviewed them, then you and your client can certainly pull out the contingency removal form and say, okay, we get that we had them up front. We understand that we otherwise had a contractual uh, uh, contingency, but we're removing or waiving it. The only distinction there is the statute with regards to the transfer disclosure statement has said, and is uh, for the last, I don't know, about five years, that the transfer disclosure statement that provides a statutory right to cancel, they call that a rescission right, cancellation right though, um, that cancellation right doesn't exist if the TDS is filled out and completed that includes all the seller sections and the listing agent sections, it says nothing about the buyer's agent section. So if the seller and the listing agent have filled out, completed all of the questions and provided you yes answers, right? Then, and they, and they provided that to you before you made your offer, you no longer have those rights to cancel. And the contract confirms that. And just to clarify, when Dan says the agent, he means the, your AVID, the listing agent AVID. Okay. All right. Compliance with other local, state, and federal laws. None of this has changed, but good reminder. These are all things um, that sellers should be tuned in on and buyers should make sure have been completed. Uh, point of sale requirement for San Francisco that's specific, energy and water. Um, this also touches on underground storage tanks. The Keep in mind the if the buyer is getting a loan, certain lenders will want that inspection done. Um, this falls outside of the inspection contingency. All right, new material facts. So this one is a small paragraph, but it's worth a good discussion because it is the thing people argue about all the time. <laughs> small but mighty. That's um, right. And the concept is fairly straightforward which is if prior to close of escrow, seller or the seller or its agent become aware of any inaccurate or undisclosed material facts, seller shall amend the TDS if applicable or the San Francisco seller disclosure accordingly. Buyer will then have five days from the delivery of that amendment to review and terminate the agreement. So it's a five-day cancellation right based on new material facts. Um, and it's a cancellation right, not a new contingency, a cancellation right. Uh, so you got to pay attention to when you got the updated documents. The other thing that this does, though, and this is the controversial part, is it, it says and parrots what, the, for instance, the car contract says, which is sellers not required to amend any disclosures for conditions already known to or already discovered by the buyer or contained in documents previously received by the buyer. So if the buyer during their investigation contingency discovers because they have an expert who comes out to the property and says, hey, you got a real problem here with the soils and I'm a soils engineer and here's your soils problem. There's no obligation for the seller to now go back and change their documents. But if the seller was doing this during the seller's own investigation, well, now the good news is the seller had an investigation contingency and can certainly act upon it. The part that's difficult for people to swap. Sorry, just to clarify, you mean sure. the buyer can act on the contingency? Sure. So sure. if the buyer discovers something during their contingency period, they have a cancel for an investigation contingency period, they could cancel on that, right? Um, if the buyer discovers something, the seller is not obligated to update their disclosures based on the buyer's discovery during this contract period. The frustrating thing, Marcia, comes when it's how we learned of this new thing. And I'll give you the most right. frustrating example. Mm -hmm. In example number one, the neighbor comes to the seller. Now, the seller has completed all their disclosures. They were, they were honest in everything. The buyer has reviewed those disclosures and removed all their contingencies. We're just moving forward six days away from close. And now the damn neighbor knocks on the seller's door and says, hey, I think the fence is off. 
I think the property line is really here. I think there's a five foot gap. What does the seller do with that? Well, paragraph 25 makes it clear. The seller's got to report that to the buyer and the buyer can investigate and the buyer's got five days to cancel. That's not, you know, that's a very uncomfortable position, but it's certainly a fair one, right? Um, here's the weirdness. If this, in the same exact scenario, the seller has disclosed everything they know. They never had a conversation with their neighbor about this. But instead, what happened was the buyer came by and said, hey, I'm going to go introduce myself to the neighbor. They knock on the door and the neighbor says to the buyer, oh, I'm so glad you came by. I never had a conversation with the seller about this, but here's what I want to tell you. Well, this says that was during the buyer's own investigation and the buyer doesn't have and the seller doesn't have an obligation to change their disclosures. And therefore, there is no automatic five day right to cancel based on the amended updated disclosures. I know that's very dissatisfying. If you have a buyer who's in that position, you and your buyer should go talk to an attorney. There may be some other right based on new material facts outside of what the contract says. But the contract says, in terms of contractual cancellation rights, in that particular scenario, there's no obligation for the seller to update their disclosures. And therefore, there isn't an automatic right for the buyer to cancel. All right. I just want to make one last point about the right of rescission um, or the cancellation rights that come up if the seller updates their, the TDS. Uh, super important, as Dan said, this is not a new contingency. So if you're the agent receiving that information, uh, the buyer's agent, you should be communicating it to your buyer immediately in writing, sharing it with them and um, letting them know what that timeline looks like and that um, if they don't act within that certain period of time, then that new cancellation right will go away. So important for them to have as much time as possible to um, understand that new information. And at that, you know, when when they receive that, there it may also be prudent if it's a big enough piece of information to go back to the seller during that period and say, hey, um, you know, buyers have some concerns about this, and even potentially negotiate an actual contingency around figuring out that new information so you don't end up you know with a ticking clock where you lose your cancellation right for the buyer um, but just to be very forthright about everything and work through it together if it's a new piece of information um, that could impact the sale significantly all right property condition and keys this is a fun one that comes up a lot yeah, it's a little right. bit of a surprise. It's a little bit of a surprise for some people. So the first part hopefully isn't a surprise, which is the seller needs to maintain the property in the same condition as at the time they got into contract. And so if something goes wrong, um, then the we have a real issue. So that's why we have a walkthrough, right? Which is to make sure that nothing's gone wrong. So I've certainly been an agent where we've had a leak in the roof, right? That leak didn't exist before. And so now the seller says, well, we didn't know about a leak. And the buyer says, yeah, well, you didn't maintain the property in the same general condition. I think the buyer has a good point there. What's interesting is when we have an ongoing leak and it's a fixer, right? Uh, is it in the same general condition, which is it was always a piece of crap and it continues to be a piece of crap. Um, when you're selling a fixer with an active leak, let's talk because it's interesting how you may need to word that. But if we have a perfectly lovely home and something has gone wrong, now we have an issue to talk about, okay? We also, this is the same paragraph that says we need to provide the property in broom clean condition, free of the personal property and debris other than that which we've agreed to in paragraph 10. So sorry, all your paint cans, right? All your extra flooring, all your extra, extra, whatever, unless you made some promise and the buyer said, we want that stuff, right? You're taking it all with you. I would suggest before you pull it all out, because nobody really wants to pull it all out. You say to the other side, can you confirm, confirm with your client, please? We have extra flooring. We have extra tile. We have the paint cans. Would you like us to leave them in the garage? Okay, that would be helpful. But the one that Marsh is getting at here is keys, <laughs> right? And so this specifically says that the 
buyer is going to be provided with keys to all locks. And so do you have keys to all locks? This sounds like it's not a big deal, but if you're selling a four unit apartment building and there's four storage lockers and there's a side door and et cetera, et cetera, you may not have keys to anything. And this may become a big deal because you seller have promised to provide keys to everything. And so if you can't, then you need to get a locksmith out there or they're gonna say, we want our keys. You owe us $312 times 14 locks, okay? You know, and also if you're the listing agent, good idea to, you know, you you probably visited, hopefully you visited the property if you're the listing agent. Hopefully you said to your client, hey, want to make sure we have keys for all the locks during their your prep period. So this should not be an, a piece of information that comes up uh, at the final hour anyway. Just nip it in the butt up front. What is that expression? N nip it in the what? Bud. Bud, like a flower. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Nip it in the bud. <laughs> okay, the walkthrough. I, I think we just did some of that. So we'll So the walkthrough really only has two purposes. One is to make sure the property is still in the same condition as at the time you entered into the contract. And two, to make sure that the seller has actually performed any required, for instance, repairs um, that the seller promised to do. Or for instance, remove the um that thing you told them to remove, the, the child play structure, or whatever it might be. If your client wants to waive the um, walkthrough verification, the form itself has a waiver. It's never a good idea. Why would we be waiving? Sometimes we're of the opinion that, well, there's a rent back. And so we don't need to do it now. Terrible idea. So if the retaining wall has fallen, wouldn't you want to know that? If the roof is leaking, wouldn't you want to know that before you close escrow and your client owns the property? Just because the seller is remaining in possession, pardon me, for a rent back doesn't mean we want to skip our walkthrough. That's right. All right, home warranty plans. So this is pretty common in our market. This paragraph allows you to check a box if a home warranty plan um, will be purchased either by the buyer or for the buyer. Uh, allows you to define a maximum amount. And there's also a checkbox that says if a home warranty is declined by the buyer. Uh, not uncommon for agents to buy home warranties for their clients if they're representing the buyer. The idea here was to make it very simple. And the idea was, listen, it's just an amount, right? And here's who's going to pay that amount. The choices are pretty clear. It's either you or the seller please don't put in the name of the other agent. That just wouldn't be nice. Um, and the amount. And your buyer can choose whatever they want to choose. And if it exceeds the $1,000 that you wrote in there, that's perfectly fine too. Your buyer will be paying the excess. That's what it says here. Okay. All right. Fair appraisals. So this is a law that passed, I don't know, a couple of years ago, year and a half ago. Um, we used to have it at the end of our contract as an addendum. It's now in the body of the contract. This goes through, um, it's a disclosure regarding um, discrimination and appraisals. So you can read this. It's in line with a lot of the other um, fair housing laws we see. And the good news is you don't need the separate car um, uh, advisory any longer. It's all right there. Everything the statute requires is now there in paragraph 31. All right, Dan, assignment. You were talking about this earlier. Yeah, so it may be that this buyer wishes to assign the contract. And so we made it a little bit easier for the buyer. If the buyer has their own trust or their own LLC, the parties are already agreeing that, yeah, that's fine. Feel free. But a couple things. One is the same requirements may exist, like if there's a lender, we need to see the lender's approval and proof of funds because maybe the lender does or doesn't actually lend to LLCs or to trusts, right? And so that's a very reasonable thing. We're going to be using the car assignment form, please. That's called AOAA and it's referenced there. And however you do this assignment, please get it done 10 days prior to close of escrow. So make sure that the assignment is done using the amendment form itself. 
and that the entity is in place and up and running 10 days prior to close of escrow. And that period was picked um, basically with the help of the escrow companies who say, listen, we don't want this assignment to delay close because certainly the seller doesn't want that. And so let's make sure that it happens and they pick 10 days as plenty of time to get them what they need to have. Otherwise, uh, could the buyer assign to a third party? Yes. And what does it say about that assignment to a third party? It says, yeah, you can do it. And the seller has to approve, but the seller can't unreasonably disapprove. And so if the buyer that we're assigning it to is wonderfully qualified and there's gonna be no delay, then there's no reasonable reason for the seller to disapprove. And by the way, you'll note when you look at the assignment form itself, just because there's an assignment doesn't mean the original buyer is off the hook. In fact, they're both on the hook. There's more people to sue if it doesn't close, both the original buyer and the assignee, the assignor and the assignee, okay? All right. All right, tax withholding, this talks about FERPTA. Mm -hmm. If the seller's a foreign person, um, make sure they're aware of these requirements. It will impact their initial take home and um, the escrow process. And the qualified substitute is the escrow holder who can uh, collect from the seller the declaration that it doesn't apply to them. And if they're unable to collect that from the seller, both parties have already agreed right here in the contract, that if we don't have the actual FERPTA form or the qualified substitute form filled out, um, then the seller has given authorization to the escrow holder to withhold the tax money. Um, and so it's the buyer who's responsible for that tax money. So the buyer really wants to make sure that it happens. The contract says here, hey, qualified substitute, you need to do it. Or if you don't do it, you need to withhold the money and everybody has agreed ahead of time that the money will be withheld. Great. Non-confidentiality of offers. May the seller's agent shop your offer? Yes. yes. Um, that is, unless you have an NDA signed in advance. Okay. Multiple uh, listing MLS. service and photos. Yeah, so this was added to make your life easier. It says, hey, you, buyer in particular, may not like the idea that MLS photos are out there. And they are out there, people. They are out on the IDX exchange, the VOW. They are here and there all over the internet. And once they're out there, good luck pulling them back. If you pull them off the MLS, it's all you're doing is corrupting the value of the MLS for our members who are later doing comps because it's only our members who are searching the MLS and doing comps, right? So pulling them off the MLS is not necessarily gonna help you with the problem that they're already out on the internet. This paragraph says, we understand that we, the parties buyer and seller won't be asking the listing agent to pull the photos from their own websites, nor from the MLS prior to close of escrow. And we recognize that. That's what that's I, all about. And does yeah, our, I just, I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to make the point, and this isn't about the contract, but there is a setting on MLS now that you can designate private photos. And so they're public until the property closes and then they go private. And what that means is they're visible to all of the agents who are members of uh, SFAR and have access to our MLS, but they are not re-syndicated out to every other place. Now, you can't necessarily pull them back in from every other place, but you know, if somebody is concerned about privacy and they've expressed that, um, that that might be a, a nice gesture to them to say, we'll put these on private, they will stop actively syndicating out. Um, and so it, it helps people make, make, you know, feel like their information is not repeatedly being sent out over, you know, in perpetuity. And kudos to J. Pepper Martins and Hud Bixler, who at our MLS invented this concept. And I'm sure that it will be spreading its way to other MLSs. You know, Marcia, definitions, we didn't used to have a definition section like this. We had little definitions sprinkled here and there. So if you want to know what acceptance is, 
Well, there you go. And the last sentence says, hey, by the way, for arbitration and liquidated damages, both parties must have initialed those paragraphs or both not initialed, right? Just got to agree one way or the other to have acceptance. Otherwise, if you have mismatch initials, we actually don't have a meeting of minds on the important terms. So if the buyer has submitted an offer and the buyer has initialed arbitration and liquidated damages, and the seller has quote unquote accepted by signing on the last page, but never initialed, do we have a contract? And the answer is no, we don't right then. Now we may, if we submit a counter offer, which works to get rid of those terms, but in the circumstance that I just told you, we have mixed matched initials we don't have a meeting of the minds on all the material terms. Is this different from what the contract used to say? Yeah, the contract used to try to do something else. That something else that we did was contrary to what the other contracts do and confusing, frankly. And so we just went with this basic contract law, which is all the material terms must have agreement. Otherwise, you don't have a deal. And those material terms do absolutely include arbitration and liquidated damages. Okay. Great. We're going to talk talk a little more about that later too. Um, days. This is a change, so it's important to note. So it defines days as calendar days, which has always been true. Um, however, a contingency removal can no longer come due on a weekend or holiday. So that's a change for us in San Francisco. Um, it automatically gets pushed to the next business day. It's however, any performance day any so, performance day it, it was all so the other performance days already got pushed in the in the previous contract so of course you can't close escrow on a weekend or holiday you can't deliver an initial deposit on either of those days so everything now operates to nothing is due nothing can happen nothing can be performed as dan said performance day deadline um, on a weekend or holiday however if you want the other party to perform and you need to issue them a notice to perform, that can happen on a weekend um, or holiday. So any Just calendar that, day you can issue the notice, which then gives them two, at least two days, depending on how it's written to perform that function. And we call it a performance day because there's a requirement. If the requirement is that it happen on this day, the 15th day, and that 15th day happens to be Easter Sunday, you have until the next business day. All right, mediation. The only thing here to remind us is mediation is and always has been included in the contract, but we added a little language just to remind us that, hey, remember agents aren't a parties to the contract. In fact, it said that on the very top of page one, right? It named who the parties were and it said, agents are not parties to this contract. And there's a little reminder in here that says, hey, we're not parties to this contract and therefore you can't make us mediate. And this is what Dan was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, and this is the change he mentioned. If the parties are not in agreement over the liquidated damages or arbitration terms, then you do not have a valid contract. Um, to this point on liquidated damages, um, if a buyer does not make their initial deposit and is in breach of contract, Liquidated damages will not apply and they could be liable for actual damages. Um, so a couple things here. First of all, if your buyer says to you, I don't want to make my initial deposit, you should not be giving them legal advice. You should say you need to speak to an attorney, give, give them a couple reputable names of attorneys if they like referrals, have them speak to an attorney directly. Do not try to manage that. Um, and that should is, worry you, right? Because the contract is very explicit. The contract says that, hey, the initial deposit and your down, down, pay, down payment balance, those are not contingencies. The loan contingency may be a contingency, right? So let's just make the money even. A million dollar sale, an $800,000 loan. The initial 3%, $30,000, and the increased deposit of $170,000 plus your closing costs, those are not contingencies. You're saying I have that money. It's available to me. It's a promise. It's not a contingency. And so the client who thinks 
I never made my down payment, my initial deposit, I'm free to walk away, they're mistaken. And the contract reminds them of that, right? And so it may have been that if they made their $30,000 deposit and then changed their mind and walked away and breached the contract, if both parties had signed liquidated damages, well, we'd know how much the maximum damages are, that 3% deposit. But ironically, by not making their down payment, their deposit, pardon me, they've opened themselves up to actual damages. So we won't know. It may be 30,000, it may be less, it may be more. So if your client is ever in that position where they say, ah, I'm not going to make my deposit, you got to send them to a lawyer to talk about what the possible ramifications are, good and bad and let them make a decision. Well, that's right. And I think the big thing, you know, in a changing market, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the market this year, of course, but as things fluctuate, those actual damages can turn into pretty big numbers. Um, you know, if you're in contract at a price and someone doesn't make their initial deposit and then it takes six months to sell the property and they sell for $500,000 less, well, that's a lot of money <laughs> to most people. I think to that, all of us. <laughs> that 3% is looking good at that point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is the rest of that arbitration paragraph. And again, those initial boxes you see, you're looking for initials there uh, to make sure people are matching their initials. So if you're the buyer, you're submitting with the, the buyer's initial or the agent for the buyer, their initialing. And then, of course, looking for the seller's initial when they sign as well. And this is why when you're a buyer, and the seller says to you, seller's agent says to you, congratulations, we have a deal. And they only send you back the last page of the contract, right? The reply is, oh, that sounds great. I need to see the rest of it, please. There's a bunch of other places to initially need to make sure they didn't write in anything, cross out anything. You need to make sure that arbitration liquidated damages are initialed or not initialed, right? So there's some things to be done there. And if you're asking why do arbitration liquidated damages need to be here? Why couldn't we put those initials right at the end? Unfortunately, the statute doesn't let us do that. The initials have to be next to all of this huge magic language. So there just isn't room to move it. Well, and Dan, this just occurred to me in your example. Let's say you're doing counters back and forth and you're just setting the counters. <laughs> Turns yeah. out you need this. Yeah. Too. You need to know what's going on with this part of the contract. So um, don't just send the counters back and forth without the rest of the contract. All right. Don't give legal advice. We kind of hit that, but on any point, really, don't give legal advice. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, all right. Attorney's fees. I feel like I, I've gotten this question from clients a number of times, just out of curiosity. Um, Prevailing party gets attorney's fees and costs from non-prevailing party. Uh, should there be an, a dispute regarding the contract? So keep in mind, if you lose, you probably are going to be paying the other party's attorney's costs. There's something in the mediation clause that says, and if one party fails to mediate, if later they were entitled to attorney's fees, they're no longer entitled to them. Yeah. So. Ooh. This one, yeah. this, is, this is an important paragraph. Okay, we're almost done. People. It is, I know. Important. Yeah. All right, you want to do that? Do it? Sure. So paragraph eight and nine, which are all about contingencies and waiver and removal of contingencies, each reference this paragraph 45, because they remind us that we have a contract that does not have the passive method of contingency removal, where a contingency just expires after it's 15 days, poof like a Harry Potter contract, it's, the contingency is gone, right? Instead, we're not in the Harry Potter world. It doesn't just poof, expire. We actually have to do something. And the reason we are in an active contingency, not passive contingency, is to protect you, the agent. Because imagine if you represented a buyer and you had all these contingencies and some were so many days and some were so many other days. And if your calendar system was not really good, then poof, they would disappear and your client would say, what do you mean it disappeared? And they'd say, I forgot to calendar it and now it's gone. That would not be good. So to protect you before any contingency disappears, the other side has to serve you with a notice to perform that says remove it. And they have to give you a minimum of two days and they can't serve you all of them on day one. They actually have to serve you them 
no more than two days before that actual contingency is about to expire. That way, it's like an alarm clock that goes off and says, ooh, we have to remove our investigation contingency. It's due in two days, and they're giving us a two-day notice. So they're going to give us the two-day notice two days before it was due, and they're going to keep us to our 15 days. And now, buyer, you need to make a choice, right? You got three options. Cancel in good faith. Two, remove the contingency. Or three, we got two days to negotiate. But let's get that negotiation going because after two days, can they cancel on us? They sure can, right? And so how do we count days? Well, it's a day with a capital D. So the day they serve us the notice is day zero. The next day is day one. We have until 11.59 p.m. on the next day. If you're always, if you're trying to keep somebody to their deadlines, just do a little math. It's very easy. If the 28th is the date deadline, serve them the notice to perform on the 26th. It'll still work out perfectly, I promise you. Okay. Could you give them more time? Yes. Instead of giving them two days, you give them 10 days if you want, but you couldn't give them less time. Okay. Do we have a notice to perform to close escrow? We do. It's not a separate form on the notice to perform form. On the bottom, it says, or checkbox, close escrow, you have two days to close escrow. So if you wanna hold them to their escrow close date, then two days before they scheduled day of close of escrow, send them that, it will keep them to their deadlines. Um, do some people send notices performed regularly? Yep. Do some people think that's totally rude? Yep. Do <laughs> a lot of people never send notices to perform and then the client, particularly the seller says, hey, aren't they way past their deadline? Let's cancel, or we're gonna keep their deposit. And then you have to say to them, oh, actually paragraph 45 says, before you can do any of those things, we gotta serve them a notice to perform. And then the client says to you, well, why didn't we do that? And you say, cause I didn't wanna be rude. What the fuck do I care? Pardon me. What the heck do I care about being rude? <laughs> says the client, right? So you need to have a conversation with your client. Are you gonna serve notices to perform or not? Okay. All Sorry, right. Marsha, I used a bad word. Uh, I've never heard that before. Ha ha ha. All right. Additional terms and, and conditions is where you get to free form. Ideally, you wouldn't be doing a ton of free forming. Hopefully, this contract uh, covers the bulk of it, but there are times where you're going to be writing some specific terms uh, in for your client. And um, you know, there are scenarios where the sellers explicitly said, we'd like for this to happen. And you can write in those terms around that if your buyer wants to agree. And it allows you the text overflow addendum. So you could type a, a novel here if you really wanted to. It would just continue on that separate text overflow form. Some of you like neatness and some of you like to say, see attachment A and then attach an attachment A. And others like to say, see addendum A and then use the car addendum form, okay? Um, Marshall, you know what? Paragraph 47, should we mention mm -hmm. that paragraph 47 says, hey, when you sign down below, if you check a box that says, you're not really you, you're really just a representative of mm -hmm. an entity, like the trustee of a trust or the managing partner of an LLC, that's all kosher. You don't need to attach a separate representative capacity signature form anymore. We're going to see that in a minute. And that's what paragraph 47 says. There it is. Uh -huh. Like it was planned. <laughs> and so show them the little checkbox. Yeah. Where, so, where the, the, yeah. so right below the buyer line, mm -hmm. you can see the example and the seller line, but look at the buyer line at the top there at, in that box in area. It says there's a checkbox. It says signed in a representative capacity on behalf of blank full name of entity or trust. And then you've got the name of, whoops, the name of the authorized signer and their title. So very commonly. Yeah, let's give an uh, example. Sure. You're going to say Marsha Abraham's trustee, right? Um, and then my trust name at the top would be uh, Marsha Abraham's family trust. Right. Cool. Okay. And that's as easy as that. You don't need to attach the representative capacity signature form any longer. And just a reminder, signing the rest of the docs, you can have the signer's name 
Marsha Abrahams. Okay. Okay. Good reminder. Yeah. Uh, all right. Agency. This is important. Make sure it's filled out. There is a new addition here. Um, that line that says designated electronic delivery addresses. And now, what is this that is entirely voluntary. It is, Stan. Okay. You so don't you have to write anything there. Don't have to write anything. But if Correct. you need to designate an electronic delivery address where you want stuff to be sent, you can do that. And you can say, hey, if you send it here to this address, the one that I gave you, it could be a fax number, it could be a, a new TikTok thing, I don't know, or it could be a good old fashioned email address. You're saying the moment you send it there, I received it. And we're not going to fight over whether or not I received it or didn't receive it. The moment you send it to the designated electronic delivery address that I provided you, right? The moment you send it there, we assume that I received it. And so if it's a deadline for a counteroffer, right? Or a deadline for a notice to perform, whatever it might be, a removal of contingencies, we've all agreed when you send it there, I received it. All right. Okay, we're going to hit the important changes and then we're going to get to the Q&A. We have, it's 2.32, so we got just, I think, the perfect amount of time. All right, so we'll hit these quickly. Uh, default expiration now relates to when the buyer signed. As Dan said, always best practice to write in an actual expiration, even if it's similar to when you think it would expire on that default. Just write a day and a time um, so it's clear to everybody when the offer expires. Um, okay, contingencies cannot be removed within the contract. This is new um, to this contract. You have to use a contingency removal form. And we've went um, over that a little bit. Make sure to look at the contingency removal form, familiarize yourself with it. Um, perhaps show it, not perhaps, you should be showing it to your client upfront with the contract so they understand, even if you're not removing the contingencies at that time. There is no all. This is something we've heard about, of course. Uh, <laughs> you must remove each contingency individually. And of course, you can remove multiple contingencies on a single form by checking the boxes. All contingency timeframes are now on page two in the grid. Keep in mind that informational access does not appear there. That's later. So you make sure you check it. Regardless of who you're representing, you want to know what that area says in the contract because um, it's going to impact your client. Okay, 16B is that paragraph. And a contingency removal can no longer come due on a weekend or holiday. Performance day gets pushed to the next business day. Um, of course, you can serve that notice to perform on any day, which gives them at least two days, depending on what it says, to complete their action. And finance and appraisal contingencies are now distinct and separate. Do not rely on a loan contingency to cover a low appraisal. Just don't do it. It's not a good idea. This contract says specifically, you cannot do it. <laughs> Dan, you want to take this? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was typing in the chat, answering questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just finish this out if you want to answer those in the chat. Um, separate representative capacity is no longer required. So that's what we just went over towards the end of the contract. Check those boxes, um, fill out the entity information. Oh, this is one we actually didn't hit uh, specifically. So it's good we're talking about it now. This contract says the buyer cannot um, instigate a local government inspection. And this, it doesn't say this here, but it says it in the actual contract that this uh, survives termination of the contract. So, yeah, so that's part of the paragraph 16 investigation contingency. And so it says, hey, you can do a million different investigations. Go do anything you want. But by the way, don't instigate any government uh, inspection. So don't go to the Department of Building Inspection and say, hey, I think there's a bunch of illegal stuff at 1212 uh, Van Ness. Can you set up an inspection? Um, that would not be nice. And the contract says you won't be doing that. All right. 
If a buyer does not make their initial deposit and, and is in breach of contract, liquid, liquidated damages will not apply um, and they'll be liable for actual damages. Big, that's well, they could super be important. They, they could be. And of course, then that turns into a fight over what those are. But just don't create that situation. If your client is considering doing that, refer them to an attorney and they will help them navigate that. And let's just repeat this one last time. Your client's failure to put in their initial deposit does not turn into a get out of jail free card for them. A lot of buyers and a lot of agents mistakenly think that, hey, I never put in a deposit. I'm not obligated on the contract. Not true. You are obligated on the contract. You may be about to breach the contract and there may be some significant damages as a result. That's right. Um, and to that point, uh, liquidate damages and arbitration. If you are not in agreement and do not have a meeting of the minds on those provisions, you do not have a contract. So you're gonna be looking for those initials um, and making sure that they match. Matchy, matchy. It's bad right, in practice. conclusion, questions and comments. I'm going to invite you to add any questions to the q and I know Dan's probably been answering those, it sounds like, in the chat. Um, and while we're answering questions, I'm going to give you this final slide because I threw it in there. Oh, This is our God. alter ego dogs. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. Look how young they are. They're both on the same couch, by the way. I know, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so you can look at that because they're cuter than we are while we're answering questions. All right, who has a question other than why is it that Marsha is so smart and knows everything? Is there another question? There are there are questions in the Q&A. Let's see what's happening. You are you answered some of these. Okay. So we I answered this one also the signed disclosure packet is not mm -hmm. the same as contingency removal. Right? Um okay. then Earlier, we talked about a PACE loan, right? So there's a PACE and a HERO loan. Those are two specific loans that allow you to purchase certain things like solar panels and new insulation and new energy efficient windows. And instead of paying upfront, you pay as part of your um, property taxes. Those are called PACE or HERO loans. Often they get in the way of uh, a transaction because they need to be paid off as part of the close of transaction. And so you want to review the um, prelim to see if those exist and try to figure out how they're going to get paid off. Okay. Um, just to Ted O'Connell's question, just to clarify, I know you answered that it's not a contingency, but if somebody's not, if the party is not doing what they agreed to do in contract, you can serve a notice to perform on a term of the contract. Just sure. because it's not a contingency doesn't mean you can't notice them on it. Sure. So if a buyer's offer includes in additional terms, buyers shall do whatever. If that whatever is return the disclosure packet with buyer signatures within 48 hours, you can serve them a, a demand, I'm sorry, a notice to perform right now because the notice to perform is a minimum of two days. 48 hours is less than two days, actually, because today is day zero, tomorrow's day one, the next day is day two. Uh, so you can serve them a notice to perform right now. And if at the end of those two days, they don't perform, then you can cancel the contract on them. Okay. And Anonymous asks, uh, can you go over the designated email address once again? Yeah. Let me, let me give you one example. The contract expires at 3 p.m. So the offer expires at 3 p.m. So the seller has to get back the accepted offer to the buyer before 3 p.m. How do you do that? Well, typically what you do is you look at the email address that it came from and you send it back to that same email address, right? And let's say it's 3% PM deadline and you send it out at 255. Okay, you feel pretty good about it, but here's the question. Was it really delivered? Because delivery is actually a little confusing. The law isn't all that clear. It went to that same email address that was, that the offer came from, but what if she didn't check her email before three o'clock? What if she checked her email at 301? Was, did the delivery happen at 255 when you sent it or at 301? There's a very good argument to be made that the delivery happened at 301. 
What if she saw that it was in her email inbox because she got a notification, but she intentionally didn't open it because she was shopping to somebody else, right? Or she opened it and she read where you said congratulations, but she didn't open the attachment. Was it delivered? Unfortunately, there isn't a satisfactory answer to any of that. And so the contract has decided, hey, we're going to provide an answer to that. And the way we're going to provide an answer is we're going to allow the parties, if they want to, the agents for the parties, to add what's called the designated electronic delivery address. And it takes care of that scenario. So it says, hey, I agree that for the rest of this transaction, if you send any of the important documents right, to this address, the one that I just gave you, because I'm going to check it regularly, the moment you send it, it's deemed that I received it, that it was delivered, okay? And so we won't have to fight over this 255, three o'clock, 301 thing. That's what it's there for. You don't need to use it, but if you do use it, that's how it works. All right, great. Uh, what was the answer to Ted O'Connell's question? The, uh, I'm guessing the question they're referring to is the one about the disclosure package and being delivered in, 48 hours yep, we did or that. The, the Avid. Yeah, I'll just repeat. It is not a contingency. It is a term. If the buyer is or, and or the buyer's agent has not done it, you, the seller can issue a notice to perform because it's a term of the contract. Um, there's no contingency removal required, but they should be performing according to what they've agreed to do. So Caroline asks, asks an interesting question. She says, regarding the 3% not being sent to escrow, what if they have contingencies? All contingencies need to be exercised in good faith. The investigation contingency in particular is incredibly broad. If the investigation contingency is five days, right? And you're supposed to get your money in on day three and nobody has served you with a notice to perform, can you still uh, cancel the contract based on your investigation contingency? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the 3% requires a notice to perform. So if the other side hasn't put in their 3%, because it's a contractual promise, serve them with a notice to perform. And in fact, if you wanna hold them to the deadline, serve them with a notice to perform to put in their deposit two days ahead of time and you'll get ahead of this thing. Sometimes when the deposit and the investigation contingency days are very close to one another, you feel like, hey, they're intentionally not putting in their money, they're waiting to see. Yeah, they can do that, but you can sort of push them by serving them notice to perform right away to get their deposit in. Mimi Bruce has texted and emailed me, um, but her question seems different. Are you encouraging agents to designate a delivery method? I don't know that I am, but it's there and convenient. I can see some teams setting up a separate email address just for this point, like reviewing contract documents at compass.com, right? As being the place that they want all of those things sent. And so they know that anything that goes into that email uh, inbox is all about the contract. I could see that being convenient. All right. Um, Ted O'Connell, there's one question in here that references paragraph 49, but I'm not exactly sure what the question is. So if there is a question, maybe resubmit it so we can see exactly what you're curious about. That's the additional terms paragraph. Guys, are we ahead of schedule? Oh my. 15 minutes early. It's because we did such a good job. Oh my gosh. I think that's unprecedented. I think it's because we allotted two hours. <laughs> so uh, Happy, who's on the right, is underneath the desk right now sleeping. Is Ellie with you? No, she's at home. I'm at the office, but okay. she's, I'm sure, having a very uh, relaxing day. Good. <laughs> All right, we're going to call this thing a success. Thank you all so much for being with us. We truly enjoy these um, interactions. Um, Marsha and I have been debating the new contract quite a bit. Um, I hate the fact that she is so smart and all of the things that I knew to be weaknesses in the contract, she's totally reminded me of. Um, and we're going to do our best to try to come up with something satisfactory for all of the participants and practitioners. Um, some of these things were very difficult, but we are doing our best and we will continue to try to make it better for you. Yes. And we will keep you posted on, um, any changes that are made or improvements as Dan mentioned, um, some tweaks 
we're discussing. So we'll keep everyone posted if those changes get made and make sure we do follow up education so everyone is on top of it. All right, we did it. All right, bye guys. Have a great long weekend. Thank you, Marsha Abrahams from Vanguard Properties. I am Dan Hershkowitz from Compass. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Dan. Bye.